immediately into my next session because these are consecutive, not concurrent. Um, we're, I'm going to be talking about Open Apple, and we have the back chan open for this. If you want to submit any questions, we'll be popping that up now and then. But how many people here have never heard of the Open Apple podcast? <laughs> hey guys, Mike, you're silly. Okay, so the Open Apple podcast was something launched in February of this year, and it is a monthly podcast about the Apple II. It is the third podcast to ever be dedicated solely to the Apple II. Uh, there are lots of other shows that talk about it, like Retro Bits, Retro Computer Roundtable, and Retro Madcast. We decided not to use the word retro in our title. Uh, the other Apple II podcasts were Carrington Vanston's One Megahertz, which launched on May 7th of 2006. And three months later, Ryan Suinaga launched A2 Unplugged. Claiming to be the first. Yeah. What's that? Claiming to be the first. Right. Uh, Carrington was a nobody back then, and today he's a nobody that everybody knows. <laughs> News in Frozen Canada is to come out quite I'm so sorry. So we are the only co-hosted podcast in the community. And I want to tell you a little bit about what brought that up. Um, I had never done a, I never had my own blog or a podcast before. Let's see if I can remember the URL. I worked at Computer World Magazine, and for a while there, I was involved in the post-production of a weekly podcast. And I did that for about a year or two. The podcast ended two years ago when we laid off the guy who was recording it. But it was a really neat little show. It was just... Welcome to the Computer World Editor's Note. Each week, Don Tennant, Senior Editor at Large at Computer World, provides his insights, judgments, and suggestions to the tech world. That's all. It was just uh, about you know, 10, 15 minutes each week. <clears throat> this guy just citing, uh, stating his opinions on the IT business. Um, that, so I, that ended in 2009, but about a month earlier on Easter Sunday, I was driving home from a friend's house and I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts on my iPod called The Trek Cast, which is just these two guys uh, talking about Star Trek. And this was a month before the new movie came out, but this show had been on the air for years. And I got to thinking, here are two guys talking about a show that originated, you know, almost 40 years, probably about 40 years ago, and hadn't been on the air in eight, five years, and every single week or month they had something new to talk about. And it was just great to hear these two guys who love the show bantering back and forth. Why can't we do that with the Apple II? Why? Why not? Why not? Why not? So I started thinking maybe we could do an Apple II podcast, like call it Apple Truck or something. And we can just sit around and chat about these old things that we love. So I came to KFest 2009 and talked to my roommate Andy Malloy about it. <clears throat> and I just said, you know, next time you come to visit me, Andy, which you do once or twice a year, we should just sit down and chat for about two hours, split it up into four half-hour episodes, and you know, it does, we can just release them like once every other three, every three months or so. Just two guys chatting about old stuff, completely different format. But we were very, both very busy. I was just uh, in the middle of a grad program, and nothing ever came up with the program with that. So a year later, we were coming back from Kansas Fest 2010. <coughs> at that point, I'm working on a lot of different Apple II projects with Mike McGinnis. He had just launched 6502 Lane. I was just launching uh, Apple2Bits.net. So we both had some new blogs. And since we had just registered domains for these sites, let me see if I can get the spreadsheet open. Sure it is. <coughs> I started wondering what other domains are out there. You know, if one of our sites becomes popular, is somebody else going to start squatting on a similar domain that to, to try to capture traffic or ends in a different uh, three-letter extension? So I started doing a little bit of research into what other URLs are available. And you know this information is about a year old, so that may no longer be the case. But I was trying to figure out who owns what domains and that might be of any relevance to the Apple II community. Are there things we want to do with these domains? Or do we want to squat on them so that we can do something with them in the future? And I sent this <coughs> list to Mike McGinnis and Tony Diaz, and maybe a small handful of others, just to say, 
here's some information that you might want to do something with. We don't necessarily need to coordinate something, but I thought you might find this useful. And Mike looked at this list and he said, actually, Ken, the open-apple.net with the private registration, that's me. I own that domain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. That's, that's a great domain, Mike. Why do you own it? He said, uh, I don't know. I was thinking about maybe doing something, um, something newsy, like A2 News and Notes, because that is a monthly publication that had just kind of faded. Nobody ever announced that it was being canceled. It just stopped being published. And he thought that there might be an opportunity to have some sort of a, a monthly summary of the news from the Apple II community. And I thought, oh, you know what? I was kind of thinking maybe about doing something similar, except in a different medium. I was thinking maybe doing a podcast. And Mike said, to get, why don't we join forces? It's like peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> right. <laughs> or Krispy Kreme and milk. Right. <clears throat> so we started putting together this idea of doing something like A2 News and Notes, where we would have a podcast published on the first of every month and a newsletter published on the 15th of every month. So that no matter what medium you preferred, you would get some information and you would get it every two weeks. So we started putting together this idea and we realized that doing both was very ambitious, especially when we both already have as many projects as we have. So we started leaning more toward the podcast because that was something the Apple II community didn't really have a lot of at the time. A2 Unplugged was publishing very irregularly. One megahertz at the time hadn't published in two and a half years. So we thought there was more of a vacuum there, whereas A2Central.com was doing a good job of providing the text news. So we were slowly starting to put together a podcast. Over the next six months, we were looking at background music and doing some voiceovers, uh, recording a sample episode. There is an episode zero that was never released. And then finally, Andy Malloy was scheduled to come visit us in, uh, or visit me in Massachusetts in January or February. And Mike and I said, why don't we set that as the deadline for actually recording the show, for actually finally doing something. If we have to get this done by the time Andy shows up, then that's a good motivation. So we started doing that. Mike, do you have anything to contribute at this point? Any reason why you thought a podcast would be a good idea? No. Did you think a podcast would be a good idea? No. <laughs> Were you right? <laughs> no. Well, actually, I thought that would be a, um, I, I thought about doing the Open Apple newsletter thing, and podcast just seems like a much more interactive way to discuss the same things that I would have been writing about in the newsletter anyway. Yeah, I think you brought a lot of the shape and the format of the podcast, because what I originally talked to Andy about was very unfocused. It was just, you know, I was trying to capture the sorts of conversations you have at Kansas Fest, which are timeless, but there's a lot more going on in the Apple II community that is timely and stuff that you can't do with JuiceGS. I mean, the news section of JuiceGS is one or two pages in the very back, and you may be reading about something that happened three months ago. So we thought, you know, we're, we're already working on JuiceGS, why don't we find some other way to do things that we're not already doing? Uh, A2 News and Notes was uh, a little similar to JuiceGS in that sense, where you're reading old news, so the podcast we thought might be a little bit timelier. Uh, so we finally recorded an episode, and the first episode we got one criticism on it, and that being that it sounded very rehearsed. And there's a reason for that. We actually recorded the entire show, and then due to a technical glitch, we actually lost an entire half of the conversation. Uh, and I'm not talking like the second half hour, I mean like half of the whole hour. Oh. Like there's just one person talking and silence on the other end. <laughs> oh. Uh, so we actually went back into the studio and tried to have the exact same conversation again. <laughs> and that was episode one. Uh, so, similar to Ryan's first <coughs> first one where he had fighting with the sound the whole time and gave up. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. <laughs> That's why you had to turn the volume up. That was so painful. I felt so bad for him. <coughs> Thanks for doing it, but damn it! <laughs> um, we do a little bit of preparation for each show. At after every episode ends, we start playing the next one, and we have an outline. It's a Google Doc that Mike and I and Andy both have access to. <laughs> Andy's something of a silent partner for us. And we split it up into all the different segments we have, intro, news, retro views, eBay. And we start putting down uh, what we want to talk about, some, something about how we want to talk about it, the link, 
Guys, so nice. We pull up the link while we're talking about it. We want to use the link in the show notes later so that you can find what we were talking about. And just for the entire month in preparation before the show, we're adding to this and thinking about things that we want to talk about. We don't always put it in a specific order. And that means that while we're actually recording the show, we sometimes say and say, stop and talk about what do you want to go to next? You know, if we're going to talk about a game and then a music program and then another game, well, it might be a smoother segue if we talk about the two games together. So there's a lot of stuff that gets edited out where we say, you know, Mike, what's next? Or who's going to talk about this? Uh, but it seems to work pretty well. And, you know, we save every show that we uh, prepare for. Uh, the shows have gotten a little bit longer over time. This is in minutes. So episode <laughs> one was down here. And episode six, which we just released last week, is up here. And I'm not entirely sure why it's getting longer. We have the, roughly the same number of guests on each show, but the last episode, which was just me and Mike, was our longest yet. Maybe you're talking more. <laughs> That's a good theory. <laughs> <laughs> I should test Maybe that. you're talking slower. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well done. Um, but I want to also show you how we record the show. No, that's the other. Damn it! <laughs> how do I? Uh, son of a. Did I ever have this This is exactly how they record the podcast. Cursing and swearing. At the end, because of the swearing. You and your. I'm going to start to edit my swearing. You and your sliding. <laughs> you and your sliding stuff back and forth is what's causing the problems. Oh, hush. Yay! <clears throat> so, this is Mike's setup. I don't think this is the actual computer he uses, but it is the audio recording equipment he uses, the AT2020, I believe. Yeah, it's Audio Technica, the USB microphone. And it comes with a shock mount and a pop filter, or if, uh, did it come with it or did you buy it separately? Uh, the mic came by itself and then there's a stand and the shock filter and there's also a pop filter, which you don't see there. The mic cost $80 and all the rest of it cost maybe a total of $30. Nice. <clears throat> we didn't have that equipment until the third episode. So the first two, there was some static. You could hear the chair moving around in the background, uh, some hiss, stuff like that. This is a close-up of his recording equipment. It's, you know, pretty good quality for a very affordable price. As for me, I didn't actually have to buy anything because I got permission from where I work to use their recording studio. Cool. And when do you have to move back? So wow. this is this is my end of the recording. <laughs> Kind of kicks your ass, doesn't it? Care? <laughs> totally. Oh <laughs> my god. So this is what I use. Um, we record on multiple computers simultaneously, which you'll see in a minute. But uh, sometimes we have guests in the studio. You know, Peter. Peter was actually in Boston back in uh, April, I think. So we invited him on the show. Andy was in the studio for the first episode back in February. And we record primarily in Audacity, which I'll show you now. <coughs> We're recording on Audacity for a couple of reasons. One, Audacity is free, and two, Audacity runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Mike is mostly a Windows guy, I'm mostly a Mac guy. This way we can record using the same software, exchange the files very easily, and, and it's free. Right. But like I said, we record uh, we, we do the conversations over Skype, but we don't simply record the Skype conversation and call it a day. The, what we do is record locally at each point where a person is. So, for example, when Brian Weiser was on the show, Brian was recording his audio and nobody else's. Mike was recording his audio and nobody else's. And I was recording just mine in the studio. So even though I could hear everybody else, the computer produced a single audio track that had just me. And then I ask Mike and Brian to send me their stuff, and we end up with three different audio tracks. The reason for that is twofold. One, I'm not sure this is actually how audio works, but there's no signal de degradation or the internet. So you can be surfing the web and doing other things and not have that internet traffic impede your broadcast of your audio to my end where I would be recording. And third of all, you know, if Mike has something really intelligent to say and I am coughing, at the same time, nor, if it was all one audio track, we just delete the whole thing or leave the, uh, the, the cough in. This way, I can just silence the one person and let the other person do the talking. 
which is very handy. Do you use a clapboard or some sonic thing to get them in sync later? That's a great question, Ivan. One that would only come from somebody who's been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask I made some things them up, but yeah. not allowed to ask you on the show. This, yeah, apparently. this session sounds like it's been rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the second time they've done it. So I don't want to hear <laughs> half of it. <laughs> well, let me give you an example. Team in Mountain View, anyway. And it seems like I've seen one somewhere else, but I'm not remembering yes, which one. Yeah. Speaking of Apple One, yeah. uh, it yeah. seems that that. Not Indeed. Hold up. So that's what the show sounds like when everybody sends me their audio and I dump it into Audacity. And the reason for that is because even though it lines up on this end, we all start at the same point, uh, you can see that. Maybe you can't see. <laughs> Free software, man. <laughs> that you don't end at the same time. We actually don't all hit record at the same time. We don't say, all right, on three, one, two, three, record. We don't do that. You know, Mike tends to start recording as soon as he gets Skype up and running, and then other people dial in, and then they start recording. So the way we do that is we actually have an audio cue. Um, this is from the episode with Brian Weiser. And right about here, you can see these little spikes surrounded by silence. Oh, smart. <laughs> and I muted the other two tracks. Three. Six. Cool. So it doesn't make a lot of sense out of context. But then on the other audio tracks, like around number 20 right here. Four. And we're all yeah, reciting our numbers. Great. Yeah. And then we sync it up so that we have people alternating going one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, in this case, I was at 20 seconds in, Brian was at 36 seconds in, and Mike's audio cues are at nine minutes and 55 seconds. So, way over here. Two. So, what we do is let's see, select. Uh, Track start to cursor, delete that, because everything before the numbers doesn't matter. And then we start trying to sync it up. Four, two. Almost, you know, but you're getting there. And that's how we sync it up. And also, as I said, why we do different tracks. Let's see. Let's so after that point, it stays synced? Once we get the uh, numbers lined up, Yes, it stays in sync because mm -hmm. nobody at any point in the recording pauses. We're all recording at the same amount. Uh, if somebody gets disconnected, then we do have to stop the recording, restart it, and do the audio cues again. And that's how we sync it up yet, to, yet again. But if people start pausing while other people are recording, then it gets all helter-skelter. So we actually have a web page <coughs> where we give actual guidelines for how to do this. You know, use this software, push these buttons, don't do this. Um, you know. have this page when I did it. No, this is new. Put your dog in the backyard. <laughs> you learned that the hard way. <clears throat> but it is a learning process. For example, ever since we lost that half an audio track on the first episode, I am now recording on two computers on my end. So I have just my sole audio track, as I mentioned. But then I also have a joint audio track that has both the incoming individuals. So, for example, when we recorded with <coughs> Dr. Steve Weirich, we didn't have that page describing the guidelines, and his settings weren't exactly what we need, and as a result, we really couldn't use the audio he sent us. So I ended up using the backup that had both Steve and Mike combined onto a single track. So I had one track for Ken, one track for Mike, and one track for Mike and Steve. So when Mike was talking, I could mute the other two lines, but when Steve had to talk, I couldn't, I couldn't mute Mike. So you would hear Steve and Mike at the same time. So sometimes when you heard Steve talking, there would be typing in the background or a cough or something. And had it been distinct tracks, I could have muted just that background stuff. But in this case, it was the same track. So I had to leave that in. But if we had screwed up that very first episode where we lost half the conversation, I wouldn't have known to do a backup. 
and we would have lost Steve's part of the conversation almost entirely, which would have sucked. So every mistake is an opportunity to get it right the next time. Right. And that's also why we have that guideline page, because we didn't have that before. Some folks didn't know exactly what was expected of them to be on this show. And now we just say, just read this link and do what you're told. So it's easy. Or easier. Um, <clears throat> for about, we only use about half of what we record. If you hear a half an hour show, we probably talk for about an hour. If you hear an hour and a half show, we probably talk for about three hours. We do a lot of editing, which is why we're not doing a live show here at KFest, because there's just too much that's left on the cutting room floor. And why do we edit? There are a lot of reasons, and I'll give you some examples. Sometimes we don't know who's talking. We don't put on that Google Doc spreadsheet, Ken put this on, or this is a topic for Mike, and we just start going down the list, and sometimes we put these things on the spreadsheet a month ago, and we don't remember who did it. It's all you. What's all me? Matt's Macintosh, stock footage. I didn't put that on there. You didn't? No, that's you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was going to have to talk about that until we started recording, so we cut it out. Uh, so even when we do know who's talking, sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> For example, on the very first episode of Open Apple, you heard this. I'm actually trying to work out a way where I can go back to using the old AppleWorks word processor um, on my Apple II to do some blogging, but I'm not really sure what steps I'm going to need to take on that yet. Uh, you should talk to Dan McLaughlin. He runs a blog called Apple Slices. I think he might have switched it to WordPress, but I'm pretty sure historically he did all his blogging on an actual Apple II. Oh, that's a great tip. Thanks. Check that out. Sure. Sounds like a simple conversation to have, but that's what you heard. Here's what we actually recorded. I'm actually <coughs> trying to work out a way where I can go back to using the old AppleWorks word processor um, on my Apple II to do some blogging, but I'm not really sure what steps I'm going to need to take on that yet. You might want to talk to Dan McLaughlin. He runs a blog, I think it's called uh, Freedom Slices, or Apple Slices. Oh, OK. Actually, let me go back and record that and get the name right. Because that be, that's a pretty simple thing to get right. Wait, so your goal is to have things right? Oh, I think, this, I think um, the blog is called Apple Slices. 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 It's overrated. Uh, you should talk to Dan McLaughlin. He runs a blog called Apple Slices. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that, I think he might have switched it to WordPress, but I'm pretty sure historically he did all his blogging on an actual Apple II. Oh, that's a great tip. Thanks. I'll check that out. Sure. So you don't need to hear us typing away, looking up stuff on Wikipedia. Uh, I usually tell our guests when they come on the show, since this isn't a live show, there's no reason to ever say, I don't know. You know, take a minute and find out. Nonetheless, we do sometimes get things wrong. Uh, there's a mention of SCSI Terminators on the last episode where we thought we knew what we were talking about and we didn't need to look it up. And we didn't find out until after the show came out that we had made a technical error. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, you really need to look this stuff up before you record it because this is being archived for all posterity and there's no reason to get it wrong. And you know, to a degree, he's right, but on the other hand, you know, I already said that if we speak for an hour and a half, that means we record for three hours. And I have found that for every hour we record, it takes four times that to edit it. So like a one hour show can take about 12 hours to edit. And you know, this is just something we're doing for fun on our nights and weekends. And that's, that can be a lot of time to put a show together. We always read corrections on the next episode. If you write a letter in and say we got it wrong, we'll tell you that. You know, on our very first episode, we said that I think Choplifter was the first game to ever go from the Apple II to the arcade. And Alex Lee wrote in and said, no, it was Load Runner. So on episode number two, we said Alex Reed Lee told us it was Load Runner, and I looked it up, and I think he's right. So my apologies for the error. You know, so we do make mistakes. We try not to, as you just heard, but uh, we're not perfect. But there's a third reason why we don't record live, or in, and why we do edit, is because sometimes we're gibbering idiots. <laughs> Uh, and that falls into two categories. Sometimes we just use the wrong words. And now for the annual Name the Game annual. Wow, we're cutting back on podcasts. <laughs> it's supposed to be a month later. I turn that back down. And sometimes we don't even use words. 
<laughs> Maybe while I'm paying. <laughs> I have no idea what that was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> we also edit because we don't always go in order. For example, the episode that Ivan was on, um, when we're doing the outro and saying, thanks for being on the show, it's great to hear from you, uh, he actually hadn't already been there for half an hour by the time we got to that point. We were running really late that I night. Had to, I think I had to go or something. Yeah, you had to go. Right. And so we skipped to the outro, record that, then Mike and I alone went and back and did the Name the Game segment. And I actually pasted in some stuff I had said earlier, so it sounded like he was still there. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't. <clears throat> I don't think that's necessarily... You're I'm not trying to do trick it. you or falsify things. But episode number four is probably the one that had the most editing. Uh, that was with Steve Weirich and my friend Chris Lackey, who used to design the KFest logo. And it was divided basically into about eight segments. You know, so what you heard was first we did this intro, then Mike and Steve talked about scanning techniques. We went into the news segment. Uh, we brought in my friend Chris to talk about the American Humanist Association and Steve Wozniak. Then we said goodbye to Chris and did the eBay section. Then we did the monthly Name the Game contest. I started talking about an Xbox game. My friend Chris is a Xbox gamer, so we brought him back on to talk about Outland. And then finally we concluded the show. You know, beginning to end, that's how it sounded. What we actually recorded, though, we brought Chris into the studio. He was actually in Massachusetts with me. We didn't want to waste his time, so we talked about Steve Wozniak right away and said, as soon as we get this segment out of the way, Chris, you're free to go. No need to sit around and talk about a computer that you don't even own or use. I said, great, thanks. But he has his own podcast, actually, about humanism, and he wanted to see how we do ours. So he stuck around and listened to us record the intro just sitting quietly in the corner. And then I thought, you know what, later on we are going to be talking about Xbox, Chris, so why don't we do that now? Why don't we record the Outland segment? He said, okay, so we did that. After we recorded Outland, I escorted him out of the building, and I left the recorder going, because like I said, we never pause. And later on, when I, we were done the show, and I went back to listen to everything, I found out that while I was out of the room, Mike and Steve had this really cool conversation about scanning. And I ended up putting that into the show, even though they thought they were just filling time until I came back. Then we did the news, and then eBay, named the game, and the conclusion. So that was a lot of moving around. And when Steve listened to the final episode, he said, where was I when that conversation happened? Because that's not at all what it sounded like. I think the extra effort was worth it, because I think the final show came out sounding a lot more uh, coherent and it flowed better than the way it was when we recorded it. And it was more respectful to Chris's time rather than having him wait through everything just to get to Outland. So that's mostly how we do the show. And let's see, any questions on the back chan? Oh my goodness. Let's see. Um, let's see. How do you publish the show? Do you hand roll your RSS feed or use a generator? We publish on WordPress. It, it, it is what runs our site, and we use a plugin, I believe it's called PowerPress, which is released by Blueberry. And that's without any E's. They don't like vowels. Uh, but it's just uh, basically you write your podcast, you write your blog post, and then there's a, a, an additional metadata field where it says, what is the file name for your MP3? You plug it in there, you click verify, it says this is the right recording hertz and everything, and you're done. And you end up with a podcast RSS feed that goes out to Blueberry, iTunes, etc. Includes some nice statistics for tracking this stuff too. What tech do you use to create and publish your show? Uh, we went over that a little bit. And actually, if you go to open-apple.net and about, we have a pretty exhaustive page that includes the names of every song that we use and where we get them from, uh, what inspirations we had, the um, Xbox Live's Major Nelson podcast was an inspiration for a lot of the way we do things, so that's a very good show. Lots of lively banter, very clearly delineated segments, so we're inspired by that. Here's the hardware, here's all the software we use for the audio, the software we use for the website, uh, who create images for us, and the fact that we're not affiliated with anybody. Ever. 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 Are there any settings or instructions that you could share on setting both Audacity and Skype, your chosen rates, etc.? Uh, Audacity, let's see. We, we export as MP3, and we just use that. 
But then we also, I, I actually find it useful to put the final product into iTunes and do a little bit more editing there because I find it easier to work on the metadata like this stuff and drop in the artwork and then I finally go and export it as mp3 uh, using those settings because the mp3 plugin that we use for WordPress will actually tell you if you're using the wrong setting so we need to go back and edit it to accommodate the plugin. Maybe I should add those to the about page. Let's see what else. How do you do the chopping and not have clipping noise in the final product? I'm glad you think that we don't have that in the final product. Uh, let's see. Well, if, like I said, if somebody is talking and somebody else isn't and there's some background noise, I'll just edit it right out. We don't delete it because we can actually <laughs> move everything around and get it out of sync, so we just silence it. Um, we do noise reduction, which means, for example, let's play it. You know, there's really nothing going on there. There's nothing being said, but you can see by these green meters that there's some background noise. Maybe it's a computer fan going. So we use the noise removal effect. Uh, we do get noise profile, which basically listens to the part you've highlighted and says, okay, that's noise. And then we highlight the whole thing and say, anytime you hear that in the background, go ahead and remove it. So that eliminates some noise. Also, sometimes since these are separate audio tracks, sometimes my mic is set to a higher gain or I'm sitting closer to the mic. So I might sound louder than other people. So I can highlight something and do amplify, which actually goes both ways. It can make it louder or it can make it softer. And I try to get everybody roughly the same. I'm sure there are more automatic ways to do that, like maybe normalizing or leveling. But for now, I just use amplifying because I'm no audio whiz. Do you take topic suggestions? Yes, absolutely. If there's something that you want us to talk about, go ahead and send it to us. The retro view segment, we usually leave that to the discretion of the guest for that month. Uh, what tech do you use? Or maybe we went over that. Your list is missing A2GS, which is mine. That Google Docs spreadsheet with all the domains hasn't been updated in 265 days. So probably the information that's already there is outdated because people have bought or sold or relinquished domains. As far as creating the Open Apple podcast, that list has served its purpose. Do you have to mess with anything like ASCAP? or Soundwave? No, because I don't even know what those are. I think one is, uh, no animals are harmed in the creation of our show. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you're wondering. In other words, you don't know yet. Okay. All right. All right. If, if you use any you music, are you having to license music, music from ASCAP? Yeah. ASCAP. And and ASCAP, and ASCAP tries to collect <coughs> money from performers that aren't ASCAP members. For performers that aren't ASCAP members, too. Basically, it's licensing voodoo. The only music we use is these six songs right here, and all the ones from Overclock Remix, I've communicated with the proprietors of that site because we used the song Tetris 30 Plus Mix in that Computer World podcast you heard earlier. And they said everything on here is fine to use as long as you credit the person. So there's the credit. The free music archive, each song in, on there is listed with different requirements. And one of the songs, I think, uh, the first one, right back to you, is actually available under Creative Commons, but it requires that if you modify their product, that you release your final product under a similar Creative Commons license. Yeah, right, right back to you. Share alike, right there. And it's also non-commercial, I see, so you can't make money off of it. Right, which, which we're definitely not. And, yeah. but, but you can see down here, the same podcasts are listed under Creative Commons, share alike. That's the exact same license that that song uses, and that's the whole reason that we use that license, is because we want to use that song. We were thinking about using Creative Commons anyway, once we realized we had to, kind of made it a lot easier for us. Do you do any digital manipulation of the audio beyond simple splicing and reordering of the content? Uh, Sheffy, such as what? So what sort of editing are you asking about? I'm just curious, I mean, do you do anything to, you know, to, um, to, uh, uh, improve the, the quality of the sound? Do you do anything to, um, you know, deepen voices to make them sound more like radio voices or anything like that? Nothing like that. We do the noise removal that I showed earlier and try to make people louder or softer, but we don't actually adjust uh, the pitch, the bass, the speed, etc. One thing I forgot to mention is that after I've done editing the show, I go back 
and listen to the whole thing to make sure that the editing was correct, that I didn't miss anything, also to compile the show notes. But even in the first pass, when I'm editing the show, um, thanks, thank you for your example. Or on this show that we could never <laughs> publish a show that isn't edited. That's really funny. That's not in sync right now. But you know, when we record for three hours, you get an hour and a half show, that takes a long time to listen to and to edit. So one way that I save time Sorry, my dog found a toy hand sign. It didn't even I was doing it at one and a half speed. It was not so fun. Can anybody think of another reason to do this other than saving time? <laughs> like chicken? <laughs> uh, <laughs> laugh, <laughs> laughing no. Like, well, we like, 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 so You're both kind of close. Yeah. This way we can listen to the whole show without listening to our own voices. Mm. You know, some people hate listening to their own voice. And I have a hard time identifying that as my voice. So I can listen to it, I can delete it, I can play it back and forth. And if I need to go back and verify how something sounded in real time, I'll just pause it and go back and what did you do? slow it down to make sure I got it right. If I need to make a very minute adjustment, I can zoom in right on that. And Brian, what is it you do as a pro living? Do you have a Mac consultant or something? And you know, it's gone to the point where I can actually see ums, ahs, and ers and delete them. <laughs> I don't even have to listen to them because I recognize their waveform because we get so many of them. It's the matrix. Right. You know, blonde, brunette, right? At, um, but I think that was the last question. How reliable is that program? Audacity? Yeah. I like it. it. Works fine for me for our purposes. Oh, sudden crashes in the middle of anything? There was one time it crashed <coughs> and I booted it back up and the beach ball span spun for like two minutes. And finally I said, do you want to recover your show? And I said, yes. And there it was. But, uh, but I save regularly. And the final product takes up like two gigs. It's huge. So usually what I do is I compress it down, which loses a little bit of audio quality, but this is only after the show's been published. It's for archival purposes. And I actually provide the original huge Audacity file to Jason Scott so that he can archive it somewhere. Any other questions before I go on to the last part of this presentation? What version of Audacity? Uh, Mike and I actually use different versions. I am using 1.3.12 beta. I think he's using 1.3.9. I think there might be a slight discrepancy between Windows and PC, but the file formats are compatible. I was just looking recently, I think that, that there's only one version of Audacity that's going to work with mine. For those who are using Max. That's yeah. terrifying. I, I, I downloaded that, that for P uh, Windows last night. I like the same thing. Actually, when I'm recording in the Computer World Studio, all that expensive audio equipment you saw is hooked up to a PC, so my end is actually being recorded in Sony SoundForge. And then I export that as an MP3 and import it into Audacity. So there may be some loss in those translations, but everybody else, Mike and our guests, are doing Audacity. And I also use uh, either Wiretap Studio or Audio Hijack Pro on the Mac to record the backup, which has the incoming Skype conversations that I mentioned earlier. Any other questions? What are you using <coughs> file format locally? Are you editing an MP3 and saving as MP3 every time? Uh, the editing happens in Audacity, which saves an AUP format. That's okay. When I'm finally done, I export it as MP3 into iTunes and do some metadata editing there. Yeah. And then I export that as an MP3, upload it, and I'm done. So the last part of this presentation is, like I said, we cut out a lot of stuff from every episode. Some of it is just us talking about well, what do you want to do next. Other stuff is actually us trying to get it right and failing miserably. <laughs> and whether it's a blooper or an outtake, we save all of those. And I'd like to play some for you. Uh, we actually originally had about a half an hour of them. We've trimmed it down to 15 minutes. Um, I hope that's not too long, but you know, if, if it starts to get boring, just get up and leave and I'll notice and I'll turn it off so that you'll come back. Because I actually do have one more. Ooh, sorry. Whoa. Oh. Asking about crashing. Yeah. Hey, uh, crash. This is a controlled blend. Would you like to crash? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, let's hope that that error wasn't very significant. <laughs> it's a and point I'll play some bloopers for you. I would actually like to ask that the uh, cameras be turned off at this point because I don't want these bloopers to be recorded. 